on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. The things that we do to make the hunt humane are the things that look the most brutal. Being in the States with our Marine Mammal Protection Act, I really respect and understand why such a thing came into existence, but it lacks nuance. I would never want to go on a hunt where I'm hunting an animal from a population that's in trouble. I began to realize that there is a need for the hunt to take place. Man, where else in the world is there an animal that eats people and then people eat that animal too? It's a real different way of life and a fantastic life-altering experience. You're talking about one of the very few natural sustainable textiles of that region, right? This is like food and clothing. The whole magic of the North to me is that inhospitable climate and the fact that people not only survive up there, but thrive up there. Episode 137 of the Wild Fed Podcast, The Most Taboo Hunt with Jen Shears is brought to you by Sir Thrival. You've got to try the new naturally flavored colostrum from Sir Thrival. Chocolate with real cacao, vanilla with real vanilla extract, strawberry with real strawberry juice. I've been using colostrum daily and promoting it as a powerful nutritional supplement for over 15 years. In fact, I just had a quarter cup in my blended drink this morning and again this afternoon. With its ability to fortify your immune system, nourish and rebuild your gut lining, repair injuries, aid in muscle growth and recovery, and so much more, I think it's one of the most sophisticated food-based supplements we can include in our diet. Sir Thrival's already known as the number one source for premium colostrum, and now they've just released three new formulas, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. They're lightly sweetened with monk fruit and combined with MCT oil to make them more soluble in water and in blended drinks, all while having the same potency as Sir Thrival's original colostrum. They're so good, I keep eating them by the spoonful right out of the tub. Eaten like that, they're like a powdered ice cream, but of course, they make excellent blended drinks too. Again, these aren't those over-the-top fake flavors you taste in so many supplements today. These are flavored with real cacao, vanilla, and strawberry, so they taste great and really clean too. Go to surthrival.com to see the entire lineup of health-promoting supplements and superfoods and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? I'm proud to announce that we've recently started filming for season three of Wild Fed on the Outdoor Channel, which should start airing beginning of 2023. But until then, season two of Wild Fed is now on the air. From the 17-year periodical cicadas of Brood 10 to giant Atlantic bluefin tuna to the bison of Standing Rock's Great Plains, season two of Wild Fed is filled with unique hunts, forages, and incredible wild harvested meals and no shortage of adventure. Watch Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern and again at 10.30 p.m. on Outdoor Channel. Hey, if you don't have cable, you can still watch the show live as it airs on FriendlyTV.com. That's spelled friendly without vowels, F-R-N-D-L-Y TV.com. You can get a free trial subscription if you want to watch season two, and after that, it's just $6.99 per month. Here at WildFed, we're so proud to have a second season on the air, and we really hope you'll tune in either on Outdoor Channel or FriendlyTV.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The WildFed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. I've got a great show for you today, but first, I think a little context is important. So please forgive me for the long monologue, but I think this one necessitates it. As a podcaster, I've always been interested in topics that flirt around the edges of taboo, and today's episode certainly qualifies. Hunting itself has become controversial in our modern era, which, given that it's our primary food acquisition method for something like 300,000 years, in other words, our entire existence until recently, this all seems strange. But even where the public has accepted it as a legitimate pursuit and method of protein procurement, there are some animals that, despite the long leg of hunting them are just too off limits to talk about. Usually these animals have been the subject of considerable media coverage, becoming poster children for anti-hunting, climate change victimhood, or habitat loss campaigns. But all too often the media coverage lacks nuance to such a degree that those of us who've looked at the science and spoken to the biologists and conservation professionals know that the public is discussing a caricature, not the real McCoy. 
Usually these animals fall into a category we call charismatic megafauna, and you know these species well since they're the subject of documentaries, calendars, cartoons, and stuffed animals. Often the public is so opposed to hunting them that even when management is required due to deprivation, attacks on humans, or localized carrying capacity issues, they'd rather pay state-funded shooters to kill them as part of a management program than to allow hunters to pay to harvest them through lawful hunting. Because it's about optics. Someone enjoying the experience is just too distasteful. Never mind the uncharismatic species that need protections, like the American eel, for instance, that are just too slimy, unpleasant, and unsightly to be on a calendar. You probably never had a plush, cuddly, stuffed eel toy when you were a kid, nor do you recall any anthropomorphic talking American eel protagonists in a Disney film. Go ahead and exploit them to extinction. We've got prettier animals to protect. But I digress. Things get even more complex when there's an indigenous tradition of hunting these charismatic species. Beluga and bowhead whales come to mind, or African elephants, or, as is the case with today's podcast, polar bears. Here in North America, we have three indigenous bear species. The black bear, Ursus americanus, found only here, an animal that's commonly hunted and with some but relatively little pushback from the public. I myself have hunted and harvested several black bears, and while I've had a handful of people express their disapproval, it's relatively little compared to, say, the brown bear, Ursus arctos, the hunting of which is still common, but much more controversial. You've probably heard stories of the controversy surrounding the grizzly hunt in recent years. But none of the bear species found in North America evokes as dramatic a hunting pushback as the Arctic species Ursus maritimus, the polar bear. It's strange since this bear, hunted since antiquity by the people who also inhabit their range, is a true man-eater, hunting people just as people hunt them. We literally eat each other. Now, in fairness, there are populations of polar bears that need protection, and places where hunting them is prohibited due to population dynamics and habitat disruption. I don't know of anyone disputing this. But that doesn't mean it's true across their entire range. In fact, there are places where their populations are more than sufficient to support a hunt, where indigenous folks still rely on them for subsistence, and where some limited hunting opportunities exist for visitors willing to pay the high price for a tag. Now, to be clear, these tags are the very same ones approved by biologists and issued by the Canadian government. These are tags that the indigenous residents can choose to either fill themselves or sell depending on their own sovereign decision. Selling the tag is one of the few ways these folks can bring in significant dollars to support their local economies and participate in the broader global market. And to be explicitly clear, these are polar bears that would be hunted and harvested, whether by those indigenous folks of the region themselves or by an outside hunter they sell the tag to. And these bears are eaten regardless by the locals in both circumstances. Still, there are folks that just don't like the idea that someone is enjoying the hunt. Despite the science and the scientists that issue these tags based on population demands, these naysayers, often the very same people who say follow the science when it comes to climate policy or biosecurity, suddenly don't want to follow the science because it conflicts with their media programmed perception of the species or their conservation status. While as a hunter, I've only harvested black bears, for years I've been talking about participating in this extremely regulated polar bear hunt. While I've had a few friends support the idea, nearly everyone I talk to is against it. What I've noticed is that most of the time it's not because they think the science is wrong or that it'll have a negative impact on the bear population. Rather, it's almost exclusively because they just don't like the idea of it. Call me pragmatic, but I don't think that's a good enough reason. I believe, and I've said it since the earliest episodes of this show, that I think all species should have a regulated hunt unless the science is clear that it can't be supported biologically. That might mean that some species are just off limits, like those protected by the Endangered Species Act, although those of us who follow the politics know that the ESA is often used politically by those who would see hunting banned altogether. It might also mean that a specific species can only be hunted infrequently. Let's say one specimen harvested every few years on a coveted, extremely high-priced tag for which the funds go to support the conservation of that species. What I don't like is seeing hunts closed for emotional or unscientific reasons. I think that's bad policy and bad precedent. 
For decades, hunters have demonstrated their willingness to support conservation by paying for high-value tags. While perhaps an imperfect system, the North American conservation model has certainly demonstrated itself to be the most effective system in the world for both protecting wildlife and ensuring excellent populations while simultaneously allowing access to hunters to continue to participate in our most ancient and fundamentally human pursuit. Which brings me to today's guest, Jen Shears. Jen's a Newfoundlander, a mom, wife, adventurer, business owner, blogger, traveler, and hunter, and she's been confronting the very same issues I've been speaking about in this preceding monologue for years. Recently, she visited the Arctic to hunt a polar bear herself, and I was incredibly interested to talk with her about the experience, the politics, the science, and of course, the meat, which I've been curious about for years. Jen is, in my opinion, incredibly brave and fearless in her willingness to publicly confront the media-driven, unscientific public rhetoric and even to weather the frenzied reactions of the activists who support the anti-hunting agenda being promulgated by the pseudoscientific wing of the environmental movement. Jen, thank you for taking this issue on, being willing to do so publicly, and for talking about it here on this show. I appreciate and value what you're doing and saying. On a final note, and just to be clear, I love polar bears, and I want to see them thrive in perpetuity across the Arctic. In no way am I looking to see their numbers negatively impacted through hunting. Neither does Jen. We're talking about limited hunts below additive mortality. That means that any approved hunting would, just like with all other well-regulated species, have no appreciable effect on populations. It's what biologists call compensatory mortality. In other words, harvests below the numbers of bears that would die that year regardless due to old age, natural starvation, disease, or injury. So while it might not be popular, and perhaps it's just too taboo, I believe in the polar bear hunt. And I invite you, in the spirit of dialectic, to hear what Jen and I have to say. You may, after listening with an open mind, come to a different conclusion, but please give an unbiased listen. Sometimes things are not what they appear. Sometimes we discover after much resistance that the earth is in fact a sphere and that it's not the center of the universe and that the thing that everyone believed just didn't turn out to be true. Let's not be too quick to judge since all too often it turns out a subtle shift in perspective opens up a whole new view. Jen Shears, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Daniel. I'm glad to finally be talking to you. Uh, our mutual friend, uh, Lori McCarthy up in Newfoundland has been telling me about you for a while. And I've actually been in your shop uh, in St. John's as well. Uh, so <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, good to finally talk to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. You have um, a, a, a social media presence. And uh, as I just mentioned, um, an incredible boutique up there in uh, St. John's. But uh, give us a little background. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's a really loaded question, I guess. Uh, I, there are so many different sides of me. I, I always need to choose like one angle to, to go at it from when I'm asked that question. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a Newfoundlander, born and bred. Uh, I live in, in Rocky Harbor, which is on the west coast of the island. So a great place where ocean meets the mountains. And um, I, I grew up about an hour and a half from here. And wild food and living outdoors and living off the land was a part deeply ingrained, I guess, in my in my upbringing, so deeply ingrained that I didn't even realize it was a thing. I didn't realize it was something maybe different than (laughs) what the rest of the world might be living. Um, So yeah, I, uh, if I didn't, I always joke, if I didn't eat wild food when I grew up, I, I didn't eat because that's basically <laughs> all we had. <laughs> and uh, it was a beautiful upbringing. Um, I am a Newfoundland Mi'kmaq, so uh, an Indigenous woman um, of uh, the Halibut First Nation. And so all of that is kind of, you know, in, in my blood, the outdoors and reverence for nature and being one with nature and sustainable use and, and all of that. So that's carried through to my adulthood um, in terms of our our businesses and and our lifestyle and how we're raising our daughter and how we interact with people and and how um, the connections are still deep and and great with elders um, and grandparents and things like that. So, yeah, um, the uh, the boutique you're in is a is a shop that mainly specializes in in fur products and seal fur being uh, being the main one. Seals are abundant off the coast of Newfoundland, and um, 
And so Lori, uh, you know, is, is all about that as well. And yeah, everything we do really kind of ties in with uh, sustainable use of nature and, and it's how we're going to be able to continue as, as a species uh, in, in coexistence with the other species in the world. So yeah, yeah that's it I- in a nutshell, I guess. And you're also uh, obviously a mom and a, 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 a wife to a to a husband who's also a hunter, from what I can tell, just kind of proving your social Indeed. media and stuff like that. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, it, it was part of our upbringing, part of our uh, courtship when we were 15, when we started dating, oh, no go problem. catching rabbits and duck hunting and stuff like that. Yeah. So while well, the other guys you... were showing off their cars, Kerry was taking me in with the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like how did it... How did you uh, become, so there's, you know, I understand having just, you know, my limited experience up in Newfoundland, but I kind of understand how woven it is into the lifestyle there. But, but obviously at some point you took this much more seriously, right? I mean, when I look through your Instagram account, you're a prolific hunter, I'd say, and have yeah. have had some pretty um, incredible experiences and hunts. So uh, you've taken it further than the average person who maybe, you know, is just uh, um, doing some subsistence, light subsistence stuff. It looks like this is a very serious part of your lifestyle and career. So I'm kind of curious how that all evolved for you. And, and I hate to bring up the, like, you know, the gender thing about it, but it's like, you know, I, I don't often meet women who are as serious about hunting as you are. So kind of curious, um, sure. how, how, what the backstory is. Yeah. Well, um, in Newfoundland, I guess what it comes down to is that while we have an abundance of animals to, to hunt and to harvest and to, uh, consume, they're not, there's not a big variety of them. So in terms of like big game animals anyway, we just have moose, woodland caribou, and black bear. Um, so a yeah, caribou, no deer you there, can, right? no, no deer Besides at all. Moose, so, yeah. so it's so funny. Like I had been in New Zealand hunting and I had gone to Africa hunting and then I ended up later on going to Alberta and when people found out that it was my first deer hunt, they were like, what? <laughs> you've, been, you've been hunting around the world and you haven't right. been on a deer hunt. So, uh, so yeah, it was quite funny, but yeah, no, um, moose were introduced to the Island even back in, uh, 1904 as an additional source of protein for Islanders. We had caribou and we had black bear as native species. Um, but, uh, w- when Carrie and I started to travel, not, not for hunting, but just travel once we had a bit of disposable income as adults, we always found ourselves gravitating to like the meats and the food from the various places, like mm-hmm. the local kind of stuff, yeah, the local right. wild stuff. And we thought, well, maybe we can combine our love of travel and our love of wild food and, and go out and do the hunts ourselves and then bring the meat and everything back home and and have that variety at our disposal all the time and be able to share it with our community and stuff. So that's where, that's how it kind of happened. It wasn't like a conscious decision, I Mm -hmm. think, but it was like, well, instead of spending, instead of spending money to go on hunts elsewhere and then spending money to travel, we can just, you know, merge it and then have stuff to bring home with us. Um, so yeah, it's been, we've, we've done some incredible hunts and, um, shared some incredible meets with people. <laughs> yeah, It's, uh, yeah, it's really cool for us. Looking at your social media, it's, it's obvious that, uh, sheep pl- are a pretty important one to you. Um, and, uh, so I want to give you some space to talk about that, but I, if I'm honest today, there's a few things I really want to talk about, which is, um, well, seal because of your involvement there in the industry, um, polar bear, cause I'm just so fascinated by that and your trip up <laughs> right. to Nunavut and, um, you know, when I was visiting with Lori, uh, I got to eat seal meat for the first time. So being in the States, you know, with our Marine Mammal Protection Act, which, uh, it's one of those tough things. Like I really respect and understand like why such a thing came into existence, but it lacks nuance, you know, <laughs> and Indeed it almost, it does. E- yeah. And then it like exists in perpetuity to the point that like our seal population down here is getting pretty dense <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> starting to maybe have some impacts, but you know, it's just this blanket rule now. Um, but the hardest thing was going into your shop. So walking around St. John's, going in there. I mean, so people understand, I'll set the stage a little bit, but you know, it's, it's called, is it called natural boutique? It is. Yes. Yeah. And emphasis on both words there because, you know, obviously these very natural products, but very boutique very like really nice high end, high fashion stuff that you had in there. And, uh, my, my producer and I are in there just drooling, like, man, I would like to bring these boots home for my wife gosh, I'd like to get her these mittens. And there they are all finished goods and I can't bring them over the border. And it was so frustrating. And then 
talking to Lori about like, hey, I'd love to, you know, is there some way I can get involved in the seal hunt? I'm really fascinated by it. And it's like seeing what it would take as a American to even be present to witness the hunt. It's like, you got to take a course just to spectate, <laughs> you know? Indeed. So yeah. I wanted to, uh, I'd love to hear about that. I'd love to hear about, you know, how you yeah. got drawn into that and also what kind of pushback there is, you know, what kind of things you've dealt with over the years and, and then why, despite that, you, you choose to do it because obviously um, there's more to it than just uh, the garment. So it means a lot more. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. So again, a loaded question, loaded topic. Um, but yeah, the Marine Mammal Protection Act is, I, I believe, a well-intentioned piece of legislation that is grossly misapplied to the harp seal Um for example, off the coast of Newfoundland, we have between seven and 10 million seals. Wow. And uh, that, yeah, that's higher than, than in, in, you know, rememberable generations anyway. And um, it's because animal rights activists have made a great living, better living than I could ever make on the other <laughs> end of it, um, by lying about what the seal hunt uh, is and what it entails. Um, so we're, we're up against a big money machine. So I guess what, when you think about the seal hunt in general, uh, several of the big, um, the big fallacies are around the population. So we've covered that off. Seals are nowhere near endangered. If anything, they're in danger of harming their own population because they're, they're reaching their carrying capacity. They're coming into rivers, um, disease and starvation will take over and that is not good for, for them at all. Uh, it's not good for the marine resources that they live on. And um, we're, we're seeing some some impacts on other types of foods that they're not normally uh, um, used to consuming. So they're having an impact on the crab stock. You'll see photos from sealers. They'll cut open the stomach and there will be uh, like 80, 90, 100 juvenile crab in their stomachs. And that's wow. unheard of. You've Can I ask a question about that? that? So yeah. when, you, when you're talking about them being – now this isn't a place where there is a hunt. Is the bottleneck here the the uh, not enough hunting is happening, or is it not enough ha hunting is happening because you can't export the products? That's that's the thing. So because the animal rights groups have gone ahead and through their misinformation have shut down a bunch of markets, the price isn't as high as what makes it um, viable for sealers to go out and do it as as a livelihood. Um, so we may be getting to a point where a call will just happen. And who knows what's going to happen uh, if, if you know, if that takes place and there's no real value um, to, to bringing the meat and the pelts and everything back in because it's a lot, right? You're talking millions of them. Um, the quota every year is 400,000 about that. Um, that's what, you know, scientists have determined that the population could withstand as, as a harvest. And given the market conditions and everything for the commercial hunt, uh, there, I think, are like twenty or thirty thousand taken um, out of the four hundred thousand that are allowable. Yeah, uh, exactly. okay. So it's so much below yes. um, what biologists have sort of deemed appropriate take that your just population exactly. just continue to expand. That's exactly it. Yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah, we're up against uh, we're up against that in terms of the population. We're up against the whole idea that the baby seals are the ones that are hunted. Um, so they they show the white coats all the time because they're the cutest yeah, right. and they, and they, they bring in the money. In the eye, right? like, <laughs> they, they like if do. I understand it, those baby seals kind of their eyes tear constantly. And so it, it looks like a crying baby seal on a billboard, right? <laughs> it's it's, it's a mechanism to prevent your eyeballs <laughs> from freezing, from freezing right? right? Salt right. in our Salt tears. Water. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, they, yeah. yeah, they draw on that. Paul Watson himself from Sea Shepherd has said or back in the 70s when he was more open about it that, uh, you know, Greenpeace, when he was with them at the time, exploits that. Like they, mm -hmm. if we make it look like they're, or we, we say they're, they're crying, you know, the anthropomorphization of animals yeah. and drawing at people's heartstrings. And then the, the hunt itself, it gets a, a bad rap for being brutal or barbaric. And I will say like, anytime you have, a hunt or a harvest on like if you laid out a white carpet underneath a deer hunt <laughs> it wouldn't look good either you know <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> the, the white ice really yeah. um, is not it's not good in terms of the optics of it but um seals and, and the hunt for them as you mentioned like in order to do it I've, I've done hunts all over the world and i've never had to take 
a course, a, a species specific course on how to conduct a humane harvest. But here we are with seals, you do have to take a full day course um, to make sure you're following the steps that are required um, as determined by scientists and veterinarians to make sure that it is done humanely. Because again, the animal rights activists were saying, oh, the seals, the, the meat and the furs being taken when they're alive, they're being skinned alive. Um, but the three-step process that is taught and implemented through this course means you need to do a few things to make sure that that is demonstrably false, that there's no way the animal could be uh, alive or conscious when you are harvesting the meat and the fur. So that involves first a shot. Second, you you palpate the skull. So you touch it. You actually physically have to touch it. And if they're watching from helicopters, they'll see you reach down. If the two lobes are intact, then you need to make sure that they're both um, emacerated. So they're, they're crushed. And there is a very specific tool that is described by these veterinarians, the hack -a pick So it looks like the brutal club, but it's actually in the interest of being humane to make sure that those lobes of the skull are crushed um, before you proceed. And then the third step is the bleeding. So you need to sever underneath the, the flippers, um, so near, near the shoulders, the armpits, to, um, to cut the arteries to make sure that they fully bleed out before you can proceed to harvest the meat and the fur. So all it's like the biggest pickle that I've ever heard of in terms of optics, that the things that we do to make the hunt humane are the things that look the yeah. most brutal. You know, right? that's like, funny you say that because <laughs> I, I traveled in Southeast Asia at one point with uh, a guy from Canada. We had met up traveling and we, we were traveling together and and, you know, like all, all good Canadians, he always had a Canadian flag on his backpack to show that he was an American. And, uh, and everywhere we'd go, you know, the, it's funny because I'd be like, oh, people would ask where you're from. I'd say from the States and they'd go, oh, Levi's jeans. And then, and then they'd go, where are you from? And he'd be like, Canada. They'd go, oh, drink Canada dry. And uh, it's like all they knew about Canada, you know, Canada dry or whatever for some reason. Canada but for dry. me, gr growing up in the States, like when I would hear Canada, I would always think of seal clubbing. It was like in the news when I was a kid. And it became this right. joke like, oh, Canadians clubbing seals or whatever. And, and, and I bring that up to say that um, before I ever knew anything about um, the hunt itself, I had already been programmed with like negative um, iconography. So right. that as I came to understand it, I would obviously already have a negative impression of it, which I think is just so unfair, you know. Um, That's but right. uh, but it is interesting too that the just to clarify, like what you're saying, the clubbing piece is actually prescribed for a humane kill. So it's here here it's sounding yeah. like people going around clubbing seals out of cruelty when they're doing it to prevent cruelty. It's That's no one exactly no one feels that it. way about fish. You know what I mean? It's like you bring a fish no. up, you club it on the head, like everyone's okay with that. It's very strange. They're okay with that. Yeah. No, it, it's it's such a tough situation. And uh, I mean back so back to the thing about the white coats. So they, those aren't actually the ones that we hunt anymore. The white coat hunt, the baby seal hunt, hasn't taken place since 1987. But wow. the image is still used. Like when you think about when you went into my boutique, you, you didn't see any white seal no, products. It's that silvery all like product with gray the silvery spots. fur with the black, black spots and stuff, right? Something like that. That's right. Yeah. So they've molted. So back in the day when the white coats were harvested, um, they, aren't, they weren't independent animals. They weren't old enough to be independent. So, I mean, the, the club was a mechanism to do it humanely, but also the white ones weren't going to go away. So you could actually walk up to it and mm -hmm. get it that way. Right now they are independent before the hunt takes place. So there is no way you're going to be able to walk mm -hmm. up to it and just <laughs> whack it on the head. You know, right, it, right. it won't stay there. So, so the shot takes place first and then, um, you, you palpate the skull and then if required, if, if it's not uh, broken both hemispheres, then that's where the, the prescribed hack a pick comes in. Uh, that, yeah, that uh, causes that, that problem for us. Um, I'm going to have to get a hack, hack a pick for my collection of tools here. I just, <laughs> yeah. The, there are very strict specifications on weight, on dimension, on material. Wow. And, and they, the DFO officers will go around and measure it. And if you're off by a couple millimeters or a millimeter, wow. it, it's a big thing. They, it's very strict. Um, so it's, it's so ironic that the, the most restrictive regulated and monitored, hunt, I would say, in the world 
is the one that is the biggest cash cow for um, for being inhumane for for animal rights activists. It's uh, yeah, it's it's a pickle. <laughs> yeah, you know, and also it's interesting when you go up to the north like that. You're talking about probably the only natural sustainable textile, or one of the very few natural sustainable textiles of that region. And so the idea, That's right. you know, it's like it's not just a fashion thing; it's like actually a function thing. And, um, it and sure there's is. so much human history with this. So it's not like this hunt was just developed. And it's also it's in- another interesting component to me is that it's not like this is, um, you know, a trophy hunt that people do. Mm-hmm right? This is like yeah. food and clothing. <laughs> so That's exactly it. It's strange That's right. people yeah. are so tied to it. I mean, my background is environmental biology and, uh, and you know, in my life in general, living sustainably off the land is, is the way to go. And, and fur fits, free range fur anyway, fits all the, all the boxes, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's free range, uh, it's biodegradable, it's renewable, um, so if you talk about plastics on our oceans, like people who put right. down fur are the same ones wearing plastic clothing that the seals will be choking on for millennia. Yeah. The <laughs> irony of somebody yelling at you uh, while wearing yeah. like a petroleum based <laughs> pleather products, you know, yes, that's living. what happens when we have the, the protesters out there and yeah, outside all- of our store, we do get that on occasion. And I'm like, folks, just think, think long term about what you have on. And um, I, I'm wearing seal boots. So maybe one uh, is involved in this, but the, all the plastic clothing you have on, they are probably right. going to end up killing five or six seals repeatedly because it, they won't digest it. It'll just go <laughs> right, to another animal right. when they're done. So yeah. um, I, I, there, I think the whole, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of lack of critical or, or long-term thinking. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that but the pandemic has done some good things and that people are starting to think local, starting to think yep. long term. And, you know, I've, I've gone from people coming up to me, starting off by saying, you should be ashamed of yourself when I'm at like a trade show or something with my sale products to, you know, probing them a little bit. And after a few minutes of conversation, they end up like leaving with a pair <laughs> of boots. <laughs> that, that has literally happened to me wow. before because, you know, they had so many misconceptions and, um, they, and then they felt, they felt betrayed and they felt mad that they had the buy-in, like you said, like gr- growing up and seeing all that propaganda, of course, of course, anyone who doesn't know the difference will be swayed by that because you yeah. take it at face value. If they were and telling the, the truth, then that would be like the obvious <laughs> choice. It's just that they're yes. not really being honest, they're, you know? That's exactly it. And unfortunately, yeah. well, you know, like the limbic brain, it's like the emotional brain is much older structures than our neocortex where we like have logical thought, right? So That's right. it's not hard to get somebody to stop thinking logically if you get them feeling emotional and seeing a, you know, especially I think when you've lived in the built environment and you've never seen uh, how your food is killed, <laughs> then when you see it, it is. And like you said, on the white background, seeing blood for people who aren't used to, who've never even seen a chicken, you know, be butchered. Uh, you, mm-hmm. It's of course, it's shocking. But it actually, it's more normal to see that. It's it's the abnormality is not seeing that. So it's like, that's, that's actually exactly a weird right. way to grow up. And uh, and then <laughs> to be shocked that people are, you know, sensitized to it. Well, I mean, of course they are. So that's um, right. I have at length on this show and, and to probably, you know, I mean, uh, I'm sorry for the listeners who just hearing me go on about it again, but I have such an interest in... For some reason, when I think about my dream hunts, they're like seals, whales, <laughs> walruses, polar bears, muskox. I don't know why I'm like really drawn to the Arctic and not, again, not from that trophy perspective, but I'm really interested um, and have been my whole life in subsistence diets. And I'm just fascinated by humans' ability to survive up there before any kind of industrial revolution for how long people have been able yes. to live in the Arctic. It's so interesting to me. And and um, I think I'm somebody who likes fat a little bit more than carbohydrates. So I love the idea of all of you these lipid rich animals, you know. Oh, so yes. I, uh, I want to talk about your polar bear. And I want to mention that I saw you in front of a five gallon bucket of beluga whale rendered beluga whale fat. Uh, and, yes. and I was like, oh, man, I want to go up there so bad. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious how this all came around for you. And also, 
Um, I've seen that you've hunted some black bears. I'm curious if you've hunted brown bears um, and uh, just sort of like what your interest in bears is and kind of how you ended up coming around to this hunt. And I'd love to then, of course, go into the specifics of how this hunt's regulated. We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, hunting is as ancient as humanity itself. And through most of our history, it wasn't just a physical pursuit, it was a spiritual one too. One of the ways human beings came to understand ourselves and our place in the wild world that sustained us. Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation today, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes even initiation. That's why my friend Monsal Denton created Sacred Hunting. Sacred Hunting brings new or even experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stalk, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat-type setting in conjunction with sweat lodges, entheogenic plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. If you want to hunt as a tool for transformation, check out sacredhunting.com. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe. There's only a few spots available per hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and learn more about Monsell and Sacred Hunting on episode 135 of the Wild Fed podcast. Now, back to the show. Black bear is is a big component of Newfoundland. Um, so we we have a lot of them. We have they're so abundant actually that a resident can take two on a license. Nice. And um, I, I grew up I grew up with black bear hunting. Good eats. My huh? parents. <laughs> oh, it's so good. And actually, oh, Carrie, my husband, he he didn't grow up with it. And I think I almost had to. I think I did trick him <laughs> into eating it one time. <laughs> I gave him a burger and uh, kind of passed it off as maybe being moose or something like that. And oh, he downed it. And then after I told him, maybe not uh, a good way to test the waters, but <laughs> but I did it anyway. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he loved it. So then that became something that we made a point of, of getting every year. And um, yeah, so the uh, the polar bear experience was was one for the ages. I mean, like you, the Arctic is incredibly fascinating and, and a magical place to me, both for the, um, I guess, my fear of the elements up there and for my love of the culture and the people up there. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a beautiful marriage, those two things um, in, yeah. in my mind and in my heart. So I, uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to, to go north for my previous work at Parks Canada. I used to deliver training to different national parks and national historic sites around the country. And uh, I, I had the pleasure of going to Nunavut at, uh, at one point about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe. And uh fell in love with the place again. And then my, my indigenous background, you know, even though the, the Arctic peoples um, are, are different, they don't, they aren't considered first nations in terms of reverence and connection um, with, with the land and sea, that's where we're kind of kindred in a way. Um, Can you explain that distinction for me? I, as I understood it, my wife's from uh, Montreal, Canada. So, um, you know, and I've, I've lived up in Quebec a little bit. And so I always had the impression that, saying First Nations was the equivalent of what we say down here, Native American. So I, I guess I didn't realize that there was a distinction between like uh, Arctic people, Inuit people and and First Nations. Could you kind of um, flesh that out a little bit just so I understand? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I'm not an expert in the whole background and history of how the various de- designations and treaties and things existed and came about. But um, generally uh, in Canada, we have... Um, First Nations and First Nations are uh, so so. There's First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So those three general broad categories of people are Indigenous people as a whole. Okay. So and then within uh, the Indigenous peoples, there are uh, First Nations, Inuit, and and Métis. So First Nations are 
uh, groups who have separate tribes and separate separate bands um, and distinct cultural uh, realities across Canada. And uh, they fall under the, uh, the, the Indian Act, it's called. And um, so it's, it, it's an act that I think needs some major revamping in our in our country. But they these groups uh, of which I belong, the Halibut Mi'kmaq First Nation, they they fall under this First Nations and the Indian Act. Um, Inuit are northern Indigenous peoples, and um, that's where the whole territory self governance type of system uh, coincides. As opposed to the with- prov- for for listeners who aren't familiar with Canadian geography, you have your provinces in the south, and then your territories in the north. In territories in the north, yes, that's right. Um, so we have, I think, ten provinces and three territories is what the total is now. My daughter has found this song on YouTube, and it drives <laughs> me nuts. She plays it all the time, and it's about ten provinces and three territories and the capitals <laughs> and all. <laughs> so yeah, that's what it is. And the uh, northern, uh, the northern indigenous people, so the Inu- Inuit, they um, it, even within the Inuit, they do have their different groups, like the Inu Vialuit are the Western Arctic peoples. And um, and then the Métis are a separate group who don't quite fall under a treaty. Um, and, and that's uh, European mixed with indigenous mm-hmm. um, yeah. blood. So so yeah, those are the those are the three groups. And so the the Inuit being the northern indigenous um, people, um, that's where the uh, you know the the north, the ice, the the seals, the beluga, the polar bear, and, and all that is part of their lifestyle, and and is is incredibly fascinating. And here in Newfoundland, I think part of why it's so close to home to me is because Labrador, which is part of our province, Newfoundland and Labrador, is home to Inuit communities, um, like up in Nain and uh, northern Labrador. So. Um, so it is close to home in, in terms of that. And, and in my work with parks, I did get to go up there to the national park and uh, in the Torn Gats and um, the people in the landscape were, were just, um, you know, de- deeply connected with me. And, and I, and I loved it there. How long, uh, uh, you know, how long have you been thinking about hunting polar bear? And also just to go back, have you ever hunted brown bear? Just kind of curious. Cause I've got this interest in, I've hunted a lot of black bear and I, you know, the part of me was like, man, there's three bears in this continent. I'm kind of interested in all of them, but, uh, yeah, just kind of curious if, um, if you've hunted brown bear before. I haven't hunted brown bear. No. So, um, so grizzly have been around like on my hunts in the Yukon and in Alberta, certainly, but, uh, I haven't been on like a brown bear or grizzly bear specific hunt, but that would be intense and, and crazy. I would love to do that someday. So I guess I'm asking because it's a, it's, I guess, you know, the idea of black bear seems like people are general. Okay. I get a little pushback on that. Um, but it's, you can put it on social media, brown bear. You're starting to get, people are starting to get ruffled about it. <laughs> polar bear. My God, it must've exploded oh. in your face. I don't think I see your polar bear on your Instagram. If I'm correct. <laughs> well, it, it is, the, it is there. Yes. Oh, cool. It certainly did uh, explode. Polar. Instagram polar. did delete a few of those posts. Um, I guess they got reported, but, um, but yeah, it, I, I do have a, a post from it and, uh, and I did, I ended up doing a blog post. So actually the, the backlash was so great from, from when the initial hunt happened that I just kind of stepped away from it a bit. I'm like, I don't want to respond to this, you know, like emotionally. Um, mm-hmm. I want to, you know, have a, yeah, I just want to have like a clear head about it and really bring myself back to where I was when the opportunity to go on this hunt came mm-hmm. about and where I was at that opportunity when the hunt um, opportunity for the hunt came about was probably where a lot of those people who were attacking me were. <laughs> yeah. And where, where that was, was I, I mean, I, I knew the, the realities of polar bear, but at a certain point, even the media begins to impact me and the stories you hear and the, the articles you see about the plight of polar bears and stuff, it, it begins to kind of play with your mind a little bit even though you know that that's not really the case and the reality of polar bears and in and, and, and the North. So um, essentially I, I was in that space. I was like, I don't know. Like I would never want to go on a hunt where 
I'm, I'm hunting an animal that's from a population that's, you know, in trouble. So I began doing some research um, with, uh, with scientists up there and conservation officers in the north and everything and through the government of Canada. And, and I'm thinking, you know, the government of Canada is pretty even keeled. And if not, if, if nothing else, erring on the side of caution of not allowing you to hunt. I'd say so. (laughs) I'd say so. So I'm like, so what? So there is something to this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) My friends are always teasing my wife, you know, because it's like a, you know, coming from Canada, the politeness level, the the, the being socially responsible, like Canada, that's the reputation of Canada. So that, that we have, exactly. So um, so when I started doing the, the research, I realized globally polar bear numbers have never been recorded at higher levels in terms of the exact area in the population from which the, the bear would potentially be taken. There is zero concern whatsoever. Um, and those decisions are decided by a huge panel of scientists across Canada who devote their lives to studying polar bears. And who devote their lives to um, ensuring viability of their populations for the sustainability of the Northern peoples who rely on them um, for sustenance and for commercial value when they do sell the pelts and things like that. And when they do make their clothing and um, yeah, I, I, I began to realize that, yeah, if, if anything, there is a need for the hunt to take place and whether it was me who was up there on the hunt or not, the, the fact that an outsider was coming in to hunt doesn't change the number of tags issued. It's just that the community has the tags issued and they're deciding whether they're going to have someone come in and and pay a fee to be able to share in the experience. Um, So that was a big important piece of information for me to to know that um, whether I was there or not, the the locals were going to harvest a polar bear and being able to share in on that was, was just kind of the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah. So, so just to paraphrase that. So, so essentially if I understand it right, cause it's something I've been looking at for a while myself, it's like, seems mm-hmm. to me that it works like this. Like you said, a panel of, of folks are determining the number of tags each year. Those tags are given to those indigenous folks to use for subsistence. They have a number of animals they can take and like they can either shoot them themselves or let somebody come in pay to do it, to bring money into their community. And they still take the meat, right? For their community largely so that the subsistence piece still happens. It's just, they don't need to necessarily be the ones to fire the shot. It's kind of like that. That, That's, that's exactly it. Yes. And thankfully we got permission to bring uh, a good portion of the meat home too. That's awesome. All right. I want to get to that. uh, that, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if I'm going on the the polar bear hunt, I better be able to bring some of it home. And so we did get permits to do that. Yeah. Um, for me, for me, uh, when my um, quote unquote trophies are coming home, it's not the horns and it's not the hides I'm concerned about. I'm like, Air Canada better make sure that that yeah, big, that those coolers of meat show up in Deer Lake. <laughs> no kidding, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, thinking about polar bears, one of the things that strikes me. Um, so I'd had I had a guest on last year, Carl Semenza. He wrote a book about black bear attacks, and and if I remember the statistic, uh, black bears attack people about 50% of the rate that brown bears do, which is still a lot. And, but they're almost always predatory attacks. So, so a bear that's undernourished, it's got a caloric insufficiency will actually eat a person. Whereas brown bears typically territorial, territorially injure people if they do, but black bears don't, t- you know, predate on people as a general rule. It's like they're starving. But I was thinking about polar bears and I was like, man, where else in the world is there an animal that eats people? And then people eat that animal too. Like it's a back and forth reciprocal eating each other relationship. I was was thinking like, you know, like, cause if you went to, maybe you go to Africa and you're like, wow, the the crocodiles take people, but people don't typically eat crocodile as a habit or, or maybe like tigers in India take people, but people don't typically eat tigers, but polar bear is like a traditional food. And people are a traditional food for polar bears, right? Is for that polar fair bears. There, what's the say? Yeah, the saying is what: um, if it's black, fight back; if it's brown, lie down; yeah. if it's white, good night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> being like defenseless out out in the Arctic with a polar no. bear after you? It's oh, it's terrifying. But, I cannot. Wow. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah. So I, I guess one of the questions I have, and um, you know, you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but I, I'm kind of curious, two questions actually. What is the going rate for one of these tags typically? Like what does that bring to that community? And then what is the wait period? Um, and these are selfishly motivated questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, no. So um, I will say that for a lot of the hunts that we do, um, they do have the potential to be very, very expensive hunts. Thankfully for the big, big ones that we've done in the past couple of years, thankfully for us, not for outfitters, I guess, but the pandemic has really boded well in the favor of Canadians because Ooh, now's the time. Um, <laughs> Americans, yeah, that's, no, that's exactly it. So typically uh, Americans or international clients are the main clients for the outfitters. And so there's a going rate, there's a wait time and, and basically it is what it is. Whereas during the pandemic, when Canada's borders were closed, um, hunters from the international countries couldn't get in. And so outfitters had to m make a choice and they didn't really have necessarily clear direction from governments on whether the tags would get carried over or not. So some of them had to make decisions on whether they were going to try to use the tags for Canadian clients. And of course, there would be price adjustments accordingly. Um, and uh, and that's where we we really lucked out. Um, so we're not, I mean, we do well, we're not like, we're not wealthy or anything, but it's just one of those things that we knew that those particular hunts were ones that we had hoped to do in our lives. And we couldn't think of another time when it would be as reachable within our reach. Well, in, in fairness too, it's like, you know, maybe one couple's thing is like, you know, they want to go to Italy, they're saving 30 grand to do it because they really want to enjoy themselves for a few weeks. That's like one yes. thing, you know, okay, well, I want to go get a polar bear. Like that's, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's right. how, whatever your focus is on. Right. But that's it. Yeah. I think I would think the tags are typically, um, something around, uh, 20,000, 25,000, something like that in a normal year. Uh, and then the wait time, I don't know if there is, if there is a huge wait time for polar bear, because the fact that um, Americans can't bring it back home, I think that has really stifled a lot of the hunts that would have been done because, I mean, it's one thing to live the experience and have the photos, but you know, when you're, uh, when you're like 80 and 90 and, yeah. you know, looking back and to, to just, you know, have the memento there along with the pictures. I kind of want that skull really to bring home. Thing. I mean, just kind of <laughs> yeah. do. And kinda I do. promised my yeah. wife a long white coat one day. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes. And you know, cause she's got a, you know, she's got a, a cabin in Quebec in the Eastern townships and I was about three and a half hours for us to three hours for us to get there. And so I always think, well, there's a freezer there, <laughs> leave, leave everything there. <laughs> leave it there. Uh, but yeah, so pretty pricey, but that, that $20,000 going into those communities must be, yeah. and, you know, and in fairness too, I, I think people need to really understand. It's not like these are communities where it's like, oh yeah, we're going to run down to the local Whole Foods and get our supplies. And you know, there's a no, grass fed exactly cow it. farm down the street. And it's like, you're living in a place with very, I mean, it's a food desert outside of what's available wildly. And then I imagine to bring things in must be so expensive. So oh, $20,000. Yeah. Well, I mean, we compare. Go ahead. <laughs> We complain about um, food prices in Newfoundland all the time, but then you go up there and you look at two liters of orange juice being like twenty five dollars, and you're like, "Yeah, wow. we don't really have too much to complain about." Yeah. Food security is such a, a driving force in in the world, you know. Like I think about even here in Newfoundland, um, we had Snowmageddon back in twenty twenty, the precursor to the pandemic. It right. was like our prep time for it, or maybe it was twenty nineteen. I don't know, but. All the years seem to be the same these days, but uh, we had, I think we had a meter of snow on the ground. So about three feet of snow on the ground and then another three feet fell within 24 hours. And that basically shut down the entire Avalon Peninsula. So St. John's and that whole area uh, where there's probably in, in the surrounding areas, about 200,000 people live and um they were in a state of emergency and everything was closed and you could see the day things open after three days uh, when they began to open. Of course, the supermarket was one of the first place, the grocery store and the lineups were like a mile long, literally circling the like grocery an store. Mile. <laughs> it was an actual mile. And I was sitting back here, you know, we didn't get that much snow in Rocky Harbor thinking, you know what? I wouldn't need to go to a grocery store in months. 
if it came down to it, right? Like I certainly wouldn't need to go stand out in, in a mile long line to, uh, to go pick up, a, you know, a, a couple chicken wings or something like right, that. Right. Um, and so that, that, that is even, you know, greater of a reality up North. Like if, uh, if the supply ships don't come in with their big shipment in the fall on time before the ice comes in, or if winds or flights are, or, or uh, weather is causing flights to be delayed, it it's a, a big, it could be a big catastrophe. So yeah, um, the ability to, um, you know, get, get money in so people can get the supplies well in advance and the ability to be able to, um, you know, have them, have the meat and everything there that they that they rely on and being able to permit those opportunities for them still uh, in terms of government regulations is is huge it's it's a real different way of life and uh, being able to pay the outfitters and their guides and the hosts um you know money for these incredible um outdoor and cultural experiences is is just a fantastic life-altering experience yeah, you were mentioning too, like the ice pack. I mean, these are people who get very isolated up there. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting to me to think of polar bear as like a traditional food, seals a traditional food, whales a traditional food. And if you remove these things from these people, it's like what's left for them to eat, right? Yeah. So once the uh, polar bear hunt was done, um, I was really excited before the food part when we were out on the ice. The, uh, the outfitter brought out these papers and I was like, okay, what's this about? Is it the tags? And then he also had some um, Ziploc bags and I was like, okay, well, the Ziploc bags are empty. What are those for? And it turns out that when you harvest the polar bear, there are a bunch of scientific samples that you're required to take. And um, those samples range from hair samples to intestine samples to um, food samples from the stomach to see what they were eating to blood samples and all kinds of things. And the sheet explains why the scientists um, require those um, those metrics and what they use them for. And like that was totally right up my alley. You know, it was like culture. It was the hunt. It was the elements and it was science all merged together. Yeah. And then it was it was so cool to to see science in action and, and the whole idea that uh, regulated sustainable hunting is conservation and you think a lot of those samples they, they can't obtain from an animal unless it, it's no longer <laughs> alive. alive. So, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then uh, then we went um, afterwards. We we went back to the community, and the the guides really knew that the culture and the sense of place and everything was incredibly important to Carrie and I. So he organized a night where we went to an elder's house, George and Mariah uh, were their names, and they prepared the delicacy of the polar bear, which surprising to us was the feet. Wow. And yeah, it was, it, I couldn't believe it. I never dreamed that that's what the delicacy would be for them. And so we spent the evening in George and Mariah's house and George had taken so many hunters on polar bear hunts over the years. And the sheer pride in being able to have been the guide to, to these people, it just, it, it made him beam. And he, he's up in his seventies and, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit more crippled than I guess he would like to be, but you can tell that even telling the stories brings him new life and brings him energy and makes him forget about potentially the pain that he's in. He he's lost toes and everything from falling into ice, um, melting oh, Arctic ice and getting frostbite and walking for days. And it it was incredible to hear his stories and growing up up there and how things are changing, but how things are the same at the same time. And there was a real sense that they they valued and appreciated that we wanted to take part in that, that it wasn't just like, let us get to the community, get the bear and get out. In fact, getting the bear was the, the least part of the, of the experience mm. for us. It was everything that went along with it. Certainly getting the bear enabled to us to eat its feet with the elders, but mm. um, it was the whole parcel and, um, it just, yeah, it, it, I think we floated home from, from that trip. Um, and in, uh, in no small part to, uh, 
to the cultural experience and how we were welcomed in their home. And in, in a way, the, the pride of being welcomed in their home and being served the traditional meals and told the stories from the past is, is a lot like how Newfoundlanders, either Indigenous or, or non-Indigenous, w- would do. Like, when you come to Newfoundland, we, we feed you till you can't breathe anymore. It's <laughs> like, we're not satisfied. Like, Nan's, Nan's in Newfoundland are famous for it. Come in, my ducky, you gotta have something to eat. Well, Nan, I just ate. Well, doesn't matter. You haven't eaten in front of me, so prove it to me. <laughs> what, <laughs> is know, the, what is the... Kind of thing. What's the meat like? And and also, I'd love to hear about the beluga whale fat as well. Yeah, the meat um, is, I would say, a lot like seal. You are what you eat, I guess. So mm. the uh, it's it's uh, it might have a bit of a fishy taste. It's it's very dark, very um, fatty. So like seal, it, it is it is good to get as much fat off of it. Like with when you cook seal flippers. Um, Another person in the in Newfoundland who's really big on the the food scene and the foraging scene is Felicity Roberts, and um, she said that like her her aunt used to, or maybe it was Lori, one of them. They said that their aunt or nan used to dip the seal flipper in in rum or alcohol and light it on fire like that to get to all the, the fat. fat off. Yeah, right. to get it all off because it's the fat that might give it that little bit of it taste that not everyone is keen on having. So I would say it's kind of like that with polar bear. You need to get rid of as much fat as possible. So not like um, a but, black bear where you'd render that fat and that'd be your cooking oil. This is a this is more like a, an eider or something for folks who yeah, haven't been sealed. Yeah. That, that's right. So yeah, polar bear is, is a lot the same as far as I'm concerned. And uh, but you can you can do some really cool things with it and uh yeah, really rich meat. Like you can't eat too much of it at, at once. I find I find that's a lot like seal, uh, but uh, but yeah, really really great. What will you do with that hide? Because I imagine the typical thing is the most of the meat goes to the community. You were able to take some meat, which is cool. I've never even heard anybody doing that. Um, but I imagine uh, the skull and the hide get to go with you. Yeah, we took. Uh, I think it was like a hundred or 200 pounds of meat or something home. Uh, we're, we're pretty well down to the end of it now between what we've given away to people and what we've served and all that. And, um, the hide and stuff we, we did take home. I still have, it was skin for a rug, um, in terms of the cuts of it. And, uh, it was a, it was a ventral cut, not a dorsal cut. And, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't decided. We have a wildlife museum, like Carrie's a taxidermist by trade. So we do have oh, a, a full polar bear mount in our wildlife museum where we showcase the, the animals from Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, funny story on how I acquired that one. But uh, we, so I don't know if I'm going to actually do a rug since I already own a life-size mountain. I might just make some clothing out of it. Yes, some please crazy do. pants please or mitts do. or something like that. Please do <laughs> I think, that. Yeah, yeah. Polar I bear think pants I are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they would be epic. So I haven't decided uh, yet, but but I still do, do have it here. Yeah, the I love claws watching are those old films SD. like... Yeah, the claws are more like a black bear's claws they than a are. grizzly, right? Like and a grizzly, shape. yeah. That's exactly it. I love watching those old films like Nanook of the North and seeing those polar bear pants. They're just so cool. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the the beluga fat. Was the is that yes. is that fishy as well, or is that a cleaner tasting fat? What was that like for you? It is. It is a little bit. Um, so it's a fermented beluga oil, and actually, where we went on the polar bear hunt. That's where they set up for the beluga hunt in the summer. Um, so they would go out in the boats and harvest the beluga and then uh, kind of like render the oil. And what they use it for is like you, we had caribou ribs. And so we would um, dip the, the melted fermented beluga oil, um, dip the caribou ribs into that. Mm. And also they would have... Um, caribou soup or stew and you take like a tablespoon of it and and put it in it and it dissolves and really richens up the uh the the soup the broth and yeah it it tasted like it tasted like home not my home but i knew it tasted like (laughs) home and and it was yeah if, if you could get a sense of place through food then then that that is it right there in a nutshell I saw that you have uh, Raynaud's, uh, you know, I, I used to be a lifeguard and uh, I lifeguarded with somebody who, who had it. And so that's where you have a tendency in your extremities for your capillary beds to kind of close down, which means 
cold exposure can be really challenging, <sighs> right? And and yeah. I saw your YouTube video for folks. Folks should check that out because the blog you wrote on your hunt is awesome um, and got a lot of information Thanks. and links that are valuable for people who are interested in this. But you made that that like time lapse of what you wore oh. out on that hunt. And it was like, <laughs> even then you had some challenges with the cold, huh? Oh, I did. Yeah. So Reynolds is something that I've had for, um, for a lot of years. I, I attribute it to my parents and the wood heat we had at home. You'd walk into our house every day and it would like hit you like a ton of bricks, the heat in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so but I never had to like make or retain heat within my own body. Cause at home you were just trying to sweat it off all the time. <laughs> it's like, well, it was like Nan. Nan wants you to be fed and warm. She doesn't want you to be hungry and cold. So we had a hyper abundance of that growing up. Um, so, so yeah, I, my extremities do go like, uh, they change from white to yellow to blue to purple back to pink in the whole cycle. And, uh, yeah, hot paws were my best friend. Those, um, you know, they're disposable hand warmers. Those are the most reliable for me because when you get with battery operated things up there, the cold. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's not, uh, not a good idea. So I liked your note about, um, put them in your luggage because I all, I bring them through, I bring about four. I have a little hypothermia kit with my med kit and my backpack. And that, that often gets me flagged going through the x-rays. Uh, so I thought that was funny because it sounds like you almost lost them, which would have made your trip impossible probably. The, oh, indeed. I t- like I, I wrote in the blog and, and I said it to the agent. I was like, if those hand warmers don't make it on the plane in some form, either in, on the on the cargo hold or, or in the cabin, there's no sense in me going because they are literally going to be my lifeline. And sure enough, that's how it was. So with, I think, about a dozen of them at all times engaged on my body and 30 odd pieces of clothing that I didn't <laughs> intend on wearing all at once. I will say like I brought all that clothes thinking I would cycle it out. No, every time I left that door, just like the heat hit you in your face at my parents' house, the cold hit mm-hmm. you in your face when you stepped outside. Uh, so yeah, it was that, uh, it was something to, what kind to of move. Temperatures when you was it? It was like uh, minus 50, minus 60, and then like the wind chill and stuff like that's that. That's Celsius? Uh, or fa- that's Celsius? Th- that's Celsius, yeah. yeah. I think minus 40 is about the same. That's where right. both systems meet up. Yeah. Um, so so colder than cold, I, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you, and, did you ice fish a little bit there? Yeah, yeah. Well, those so fish must be land. frozen the second they hit the ice, right? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, so we did ice fish up there compared to Newfoundland. Like we, we have such, I mean, we have cold winters, but cold to us is not cold to up yeah. there. We do have the humidity, um, but uh, not yet. Yeah, I mean, minus two it, with the humidity can feel like minus 10, but minus 50 and minus 60 just feels like minus <laughs> Whole 50. Whole other category. Yeah. Whole <laughs> yeah. It's cool that that bear hunt will, you know, the memory of that as a hardship, you know? Like, cause if you could just waltz up there and shoot a polar bear, I mean, it would just be kind of, I don't know, probably wouldn't have the same kind of a meaning and impact and memory for you as that you had to endure something that could have taken your life as far as, you know, climate yeah, goes. That, that's so true. It does. It does add to it. Like the, like I said earlier, the whole magic of the North to me is that inhospitable climate and the fact that people not only survive up there, but thrive up there long before any technological advances existed is just a testament to the, to the spirit of, uh, of the people. And, um, it, it really, uh, it's so endearing to me and, and makes me treasure the fact that, uh, they're willing to welcome us into their communities and share that with us. Yeah. Wow. It's, I'm, I, uh, I want to say like I'm envious, but I mean it in a way like I'm so happy for you. So it's not like that, like I wish I could have, but it's that like, oh, I really hope I get to too. It's just really cool. I hope you do as my, well. Uh, my production team is, everybody's like, nope, you can't. No, you cannot. <laughs> yeah. We are not doing that. Like we are not filming that. You cannot do it. Uh, there's, a, there's several animals on the list and they're all the ones that I'm really interested in. Uh, <laughs> but what's on the horizon for you? You know, uh, what, what's, what's next or what are you really looking forward to? 
Well, um, we just got into commercial inshore fishing last year. So Carrie purchased a license. And oh, cool. so earlier today, that's what I was at before signing into this. I was running around um, delivering lobsters to the fish plant and getting my hands caught up, trying to shell some of them to make sandwiches for the guys and stuff nice. out on the water. So so that's, uh, that's keeping us really busy. And then um, the spring bear hunt will be coming up soon. So hopefully I'll be... Uh, in a position to get going on that and um and then applying for I, I have applied for moose again here this year i don't know if i'll get a license because i have one last year and it's usually like every year or two you can get a moose license in newfoundland depending on the area you apply for but um yeah just it, it's the first summer in a while that we we don't have a, a sheep hunt booked uh, uh, yeah. so it's going to be really nice to get to enjoy all five days or weeks of newfoundland summer <laughs> it depends on the year sometimes you get five days sometimes right. you get five weeks no more though but uh yeah it'll be it'll be nice actually to have that change of pace to, to be able to stay home and and you know experience a true summer out on the water and out in the hills and stuff here so we're, we're really looking forward to that such a beautiful place up there it's so amazing um yeah, and and uh, maybe just tell folks. I think I'd really like folks to go check out that article you wrote, and um, but tell folks about your social media as well. You've got a pretty robust Instagram page uh, with lots of great stuff there, and uh, tell people you know send people where you'd like them to go. Yeah, thanks. So I am, I guess, most active on Instagram, although that's slowed down a little bit in the last couple months because we're we're so busy with everything we have going on. But um, I am Smidgen on Instagram, so that's S M I D. J-E-N, smidgen. And uh, it's just a play on words. My great nan, her favorite word was always smidgen. I, if you asked her if she wanted some pie, she'd say, oh, my love, I'll have a little smidgen of it. And so, yeah, I, I just uh, played on words with my name, Jen. And uh, I, have a, I have a blog, jenshears.com, and that's where you'll find the polar bear article um, that I, I wrote after two years, again, when I was out of the kind of attack mode from, mm. you know, trying to st stop off the attacks from people. Um, and I got to sit down and, and really write it from a, a good headspace and bring myself back to where I was beforehand. And uh, just, yeah, a lot of things uh, on that blog about um, bringing children into the outdoors and the different hunts and recipes and things like that. And uh, I am on Facebook as well, Jen Shears Outdoors, but certainly my blog and, and Instagram are where I'm most active. So anyone can check it out. And I'm always happy to hear from people. So send me an email and uh, or a DM and it, it'd be great. I'll be following along because, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome to see the kind of things you guys are getting up to. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for sharing about this story. Um, very excited to get a firsthand account from somebody, you know. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. A real honor. And, and thank you for doing what you do. You know, I think the, the further that we, uh, we get away from um, nature, then the more susceptible it is to being destroyed. And um, one of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes ever um, is from Clarissa Pinkola Estes from Women Who Run With the Wolves. And it goes, it's not by accident that the pristine wilderness of our planet disappears as the understanding of our own inner wild nature fades. Mm. And that, that kind of encompasses everything about what, what we do, I think, and, and why people who are busy in the city maybe don't have the connection to food that they do and the connection to wild places and the intricacy of, of the planet and living things. And, so that's why, you know, when propaganda comes by their uh, screens, it, you get that emotional reaction because they don't have that wild nature, um, you know, at their doorstep and pulling on their, their soul and their blood and their heartstrings. So um, thank you for what you do because you, you know, you reinvigorate that in people and, uh, and it's really important in this day and age. Oh, I appreciate that, but especially coming from somebody as bold as yourself, it's like, you know, these are some taboos you're taking on and, uh, and, and you seem to be taking it in stride. I just, I'm impressed that you can um, withstand it. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty awesome to me. So yeah, yeah. your Thank work you. is very appreciated. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. 
Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.